Hello everyone, um, I just um, probably have to introduce a minor correction. I'm a visiting professional with the International Criminal Court and today I will speak um, about my legal practice as a Ukrainian lawyer in Ukraine on international humanitarian and criminal law issues. Um, I should make a disclaimer that surely it's a very challenging thing to practice um, the armed conflict issues in your own country. I'm trying to be as impartial as possible, but if you notice any bias from me as a Ukrainian lawyer practicing in Ukrainian, please do speak up and I will be very, very happy to address them. Um, my presentation is called Do No Harm. Um, the book uh, by a celebrated British neurosurgeon, um, Henry Marsh, was called, is called Do No Harm. And he, who is also practicing a surgery in Ukraine, says that his Ukrainian colleagues often suffer from an unjustified surgical activism when they are too active and too willing to operate in the cases which uh, are unoperatable, which might be only aggravated by the intervention. And unfortunately, sometimes it also happens with the civil society in Ukraine, because having faced an armed conflict, an issue the Ukrainians have neither uh, predicted uh, nor were quite ready to tackle, uh, just gave rise to many challenge, many challenges. So um, on the first slide you can see uh, the Maidan Square. Basically this is the central Kiev where the Revolution of Dignity started in 2013. Um, it uh, cu uh, culminated in mass shootings of the protesters and eventually the occupation of Crimea followed and the armed conflict in Donbas in the eastern region of the country. Um, with the proxies, um, pro-Russian proxies who are allegedly supported by Russia. Here you can see this neurosurgeon, Henry Marsh, also in Maidan Square, um, who commented on this unjustified activism of the Ukrainians. But is it really unjustified? Uh, the case of emergency followed uh, in the legal domain um, in such a manner. Um, Ukraine um, could not investigate or prosecute the alleged perpetrators of the Maidan crimes or of the crimes which are committed in Crimea and in Donbas because first many alleged perpetrators have left the country to Russia or elsewhere so they are not there physically and um, uh, second there are certain other um, um, expert limitations because surely the domestic uh, prosecutors, judges have not dealt with the law of armed conflict. So the International Criminal Court be became the first option, the primary and evident option to pursue the in individual criminal responsibility of those allegedly responsible for the grave violations in the country. Um, Ukraine uh, signed uh, the Rome Statute in, 2000, in the 2000s, but it did not ratify the statute due to some constitutional limitations. So what the country did in 2014 and 15, the country recognized the ad hoc, basically, jurisdiction of the court under Article 12.3 of the Rome Statute. So basically, Ukraine has invited uh, the Rome Statute to step in and look at the situation in the country. At the moment, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court is doing a preliminary examination of the situation in the country. So what does it mean? It means that uh, it's not a full-scale investigation yet, so currently the Office of the Prosecutor is examining whether there is a reasonable basis to believe that the crimes uh, falling within the jurisdiction of the court, namely the war crimes and crimes against humanity in case of Ukraine, have been committed. And if the, uh, she, the, if the prosecutor is uh, satisfied with that, she will proceed with a full-scale investigation. And to catalyze this uh, um, uh, investigation and to catalyze justice for the country, the civil society has uh, stepped in. 
Um, I will um, address the five principal innovations or where the Ukrainian civil society has helped to uh, bring more justice to the uh, victims of the alleged war crimes and crimes against humanity in Ukraine. And I should explain that by the civil society, I mean the practicing lawyers, the NGOs, the media and the academia. Uh, so the first thing is that the growing role of domestic NGOs in documenting the war crimes and submitting the evidence to the International Criminal Court. Both the well-established NGOs like the Helsinki Human Rights Union and the newly established NGOs like the Regional Center for Human Rights have been actually um, in the avant-garde. Um, they were in the front um, <coughs> even before the prosecutor's offices pointing at the violations first committed by all sides to the conflict and second at the violations that were not on the radar of the state authorities yet. Uh, for example, um, the Ukrainian NGOs were first to look at violations against cultural property in occupied Crimea and the prosecutor's general's office was not looking at that crime at the time. But as the evidence was collected, the prosecutor's office, offices were sure that indeed it was the case, it was a violation and they started their own cases. So we can definitely see that the domestic NGOs and human rights in Ukraine have impacted the case selection in domestic proceedings. Second, there has been the unprecedented cooperation between NGOs and traditionally reserved state authorities. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the um, Soviet and post-Soviet uh, prosecutorial and law enforcement system, but I presume you can understand that these institutions have been very male-dominated, very close to external consultancy and very reserved um, in their reporting. But understanding the limitations of their expertise, uh, the state security offices, the prosecutor general's office, uh, the MPs, the government, the Ministry of Justice have become, have become open to the consultancy from uh, domestic and foreign NGOs. What has uh, that changed? That has changed um, the attitude that uh, we can now see the um, press events from the Prosecutor General of Ukraine, who not only admits but really celebrates the cooperation with NGOs. This, this has never been the case on the post-Soviet space. Um, very recently, uh, just in February, the Prosecutor General announced quite proudly that together with domestic NGOs, they submitted a new communication to the International Criminal Court on the appropriation of property in occupied Crimea. So we can see this, um, uh, that the NGO sector is more accepted and recognized by the state sector, and this is, this is very important. Uh, basically, this is the third point that I would like to address. This is the growing state openness to um, the consultancy not only from domestic actors, but also from external actors. Uh, the company that I work for is run by a British barrister and American attorney, and one could never expect um, say Ukrainian prosecutor's office um, being open to the consultancy from a British barrister, but actually this is what they're currently doing. Uh, they do receive the recommendations, they do invite um, the um, practice in international lawyers to train the Ukrainian judiciary, the newly formed Supreme Court of Ukraine, on IHL and on ICL, because as the uh, judges were not really familiar with the international humanitarian law, some um, war crimes proceedings were conducted in Ukraine domestically, were criticized for not fully meeting the international humanitarian law requirements. So there is this openness to the current training of the new judiciary in Ukraine by including foreign experts. Um, First, we're speaking about the enhanced legal training of the military. As you know, the International Criminal Court looks an, uh, into the situation as a whole, not just at the violations committed by one 
party to a conflict. So certainly uh, the Ukrainians are the government are interested to um, ensure that their military, their servicemen are as knowledgeable about IHL as possible because this is their primary protection, ensuring that they are not committing the war crimes, ensuring that the shelling they do complies with the principal, uh, principles of uh, uh, distinction and, and other <coughs> IHL standards. So we've also currently experiencing this huge uh, civil society uh, participation in training of the military. Again, this is something that could never happen uh, even a couple of years ago because the military has traditionally been in the Soviet Union and in the post-Soviet countries a very close traditional and reserved area, close to the foreign consultancy. And fifth, uh, the civil society, namely Amnesty International, Global Rights Compliance, my private, basically, a law company, um, local NGOs and the academia are uh, contributing greatly to amending the domestic criminal legislation. Um, f um, the Rome Statute crimes, the war crimes and crimes against humanity have not been properly incorporated into domestic law in Ukraine, not only in Ukraine, also in Georgia and in Moldova. Georgians also had to amend their domestic legislation when the armed conflict with Russia happened. So uh, the principal flaws that the civil society has helped to eradicate from domestic law are as follows. First, all uh, the majority uh, of uh, the um, war crimes incorporated in the Rome Statute um, are in the new draft code amending uh, in the new draft law amending the criminal code of Ukraine. Second, uh, the penalties, the approach to uh, punishment uh, is also incorporated properly because currently uh, there is this disbalance between the penalty options in the Ukrainian criminal code. For instance, it provides an option of only 10 to 15 imprisonment for a war crime or a life imprisonment. So we see a clear disproportionate approach to punishing war criminals. This has been corrected. Also, we are um, installing, uh, we are adding uh, new crimes such as a crime of enslavement, of persecution and enforced disappearance. These crimes uh, have, have not been recognized by um, the Soviets and they have not been uh, recognized in the um, independent post-Soviet states. But currently we see that the, in, uh, the armed conflicts demand that they be in domestic legislation. So this is something that the civil society also is reassuring the domestic authorities to change and to implement. Thank you. Um, there have been also <coughs> complications. As I'm saying, uh, Dr. Marsh said that uh, the um, involvement can also be sometimes harmful. For instance, the mass media have provide their own version of international law, they raise the unjustified expectations. For example, uh, many mass media not knowledgeable about international law claim that the ICC will definitely adjudicate the uh, Maidan crimes, the shootings uh, in the central square of Kyiv, not understanding the limitations that the widespread and systematic criteria require by the ICC. Surely they raise the unjustified expectations from the victims and they, uh, such unjustified reports by the media, they create the tension within the society when they don't receive the judgment when, which they expected. But they couldn't expect it because the jurisdiction of the court or the admissibility of the court did not allow for it. And unfortunately, not all media explain that. Although there is a legal activism concerning, for instance, trials in absentia, people want to prosecute so much that they have um, adopted uh, the authorities to meet the public demand, adopted the amendments uh, on the trials in absentia, which don't, which don't really meet the fair trial standards of the European Court of Human Rights, of notified a waiver of a... Um, of a right to retrial. And also there is a huge lack of scholarly voice. The Ukrainians don't really participate in forming the discourse, the narration about the, what's happening in the country. All the discourse is usually led by Western lawyers. So this is also my appeal to my colleagues in Ukraine, and I also say that in Ukraine, that you should contribute, you should provide your own vision to make this international law truly international. Um, but there are more voices now. I'm happy to speak to you now. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.